And let's turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 30. Sunday nights through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. And we remember that the children of Israel find themselves camped on the eastern side of the Jordan River, uh, opposite the city of Jericho, which will be the first city that they will conquer in their conquest of uh, the promised land of Canaan. And so they've been uh, just about 40 years, just a little bit shy of it at this point, of uh, getting from Egypt to uh, this, this particular place. An 11-day journey took 40 years, and uh, that's what an absence of faith and obedience will do to us. But uh, they are uh, situated properly now, and the Lord is just kind of taking care of some final details preparing them for entering into the land. We pick things up in chapter 30, verse 1. And then the, Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes, 12 tribes of Israel, concerning the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. So, I mean, this almost seems kind of odd and out of place, this chapter in some respects, that in the grand scheme of things for where they've been and what they're going to do, and he's going to talk with them about vows, about keeping their word. And, uh, but there's a reason for it, as we'll see a little bit later in the chapter. He said, if a man makes a vow to the Lord... Or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement. So you have a person saying, making a vow, God, I promise to do this for you. Or it doesn't just include vows to the Lord, but includes vows from one person to another. I'd say to Debbie, Debbie, I vow to do this for you on Tuesday. So these are the kind of, it's talking about both with God and with men. He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So here you have a man and uh, he is because he is a man and he is uh, if he is married he is the head of household in terms of authority by virtue of that if he is single of course he is the head of his household he is the household but in terms of a man if a man took and made a vow to God or a vow to someone else he was to keep that vow no matter what there was no moving out from under it no excuses no trying to get out from under it he was to keep the vow that came out of his mouth. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and she binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house in her youth. So now you have a daughter of a father. The daughter is unmarried, so she is still at home and she is under her father's authority. So she makes a vow now to God and uh, she doesn't quite have the freedom that her father has uh, for reasons that we'll get to in, in just a moment. So she makes this uh, vow, binds herself by some agreement. And verse 4, if her father hears her vow and the agreement by which she has bound herself and her father holds her, his peace and his silence would be viewed as consent uh, to what she had vowed, then all of her vows shall stand and every agreement with which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father steps in, listens to what she vows, and in his wisdom and, and uh, perspective, he doesn't agree that it's a wise vow, if he can then overrule her on the day that he hears what it is that she says, and then none of her vows nor her agreements by which she was, has bound herself shall stand, and the Lord will release her because her father overruled her. So the Lord's trying to accomplish two things among his people here. He is giving this whole law related to vows, not so that people could make vows and promises and then try and get out from under them, try to look for some technicality to not keep their word. He is communicating to his people that when we give our word, we make a vow to God or man, to man, we are to keep that uh, vow. Now, we we'll stop there and I, I run the risk of forgetting my second thought by virtue of doing that. But these are the problems I face. But. When, when we look about at God taking an entire chapter talking about our integrity as his people to keep our vows, very, very important. If no one else in the entire nation or world gives their word and keeps their word, we're to do it. Now, you and I live in a country and we live in a state that will not only not keep their vows in terms of federal and state government, um, they won't even enforce the laws that they have enacted. This is a, a, a significant frustration to me. 
So here you have a government, national and state level, who pass laws, do not keep the laws, then model before the citizens of the United States that you can make your word, give your word, and then keep it or not keep it as is convenient for you financially or otherwise, and it's okay. Then we wonder why people then look and say, I'll do it in my own private life. And then our streets are filled with crime. Uh, the government, for instance, state of California, using smoke and mirrors to balance its budget when it is constrained by law to balance its budget legitimately year in and year out. And so we see people that are spending, you know, like the old sayings is like drunken sailors out of control and uh, forfeiting the future and all of these kinds of things. And, and we say, how can you criticize them for it when the government models that for them? So we've got this. We live in a place where even the word of government doesn't mean that much anymore. But no matter who obeys or keeps their vows or not, we are to keep our vows. So this is what the Lord is calling us to do. Now, he is he is communicating to them, keep your vows. I want my people to be known as people of their word in this world, even if nobody else in the world is keeping their word. He has to do it at the same time of, of juggling at the same time, uh, protecting the authority structure of the home. And the husband or the, the father in, in a home was the ultimate authority. He had ultimate not only did he have uh, the, the privilege of, of the authority of being the final say on the decisions within the household, but there was a responsibility associated with that. So if his wife, or as we'll see in just a couple of minutes, or his daughter makes a vow and he listens to that vow as the head of the household and he says, that's a nice thought. But it jeopardizes the health of this family. It's not a wise vow that's being made. And because I have the ultimate responsibility for what happens to this family, I overrule that vow for the sake of the family. It might be good for you, but it's not good for this family at this time. So we're to be people of our word. But he was allowing the, the father, the head of the household, husband, to overrule when necessary from his perspective. It, God didn't want to kind of uh, destabilize the authority structure of, of the uh, Old Testament and Christian uh, home. If indeed, verse 6, she takes a husband. So now you have... The, uh, a married woman, while bound by her vows uh, or by a rash utterance from her lips by which she has bound herself. If her husband hears this vow and, it's, uh, and makes no response to her on the day that he hears this vow, then her vows shall stand. So silence was viewed as consent on his part and her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand. Now, this is very good. God knows us so well. So here you got this husband. OK, you got this dad. And uh, his daughter or his wife makes a vow. And he listens to it and he says, well, I don't know about that. But, you know, it, it, it might, might be a good vow. It might turn out good for us. So I'll just keep my mouth shut. And I won't, you know, say it's good or I won't say it's bad. And uh, nobody will know what. And then if it turns out bad for us, then I'll jump up and, you know, say, no, I never, I, I didn't say yes or I didn't say no. God comes in and says, no, no, no. If you, you got one time to object to it. And to overrule the vow and that and, and you can't uh, come in later and then try and do something, uh, you know, to undo it a little bit later. So he knows what's in our hearts sometimes, the little games that people can pay, play to get out or around from keeping their vows. So if he listens, he doesn't uh, invalidate the vow immediately. She has bound herself. Uh, the agreements that she has bound herself shall stand. But if her husband overrules her on that day that he hears it, he shall make void her vow, which she took and what she uttered with her lips by which she bound herself 
and the Lord will release her. So he honors the authority structure within a household. If also any vow of a widow, so she's, she is her own authority structure, so she's not under a husband or anything like that, or a divorced woman by which she has bound herself, any vow that she binds herself to, just like the, the, the man or the, the single man or the husband, he, the, that vow shall stand against her. She's to keep that vow absolutely. If she, uh, another example, if uh, a woman vowed in her husband's house or bound herself by an agreement with an oath and her husband heard it and made no response to her and did not overrule her, then all her vows shall stand and every agreement by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband truly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatever proceeded from her lips concerning her vows or concerning the agreement binding her, it shall not stand. Her husband has made them void and the Lord will release her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict her soul, her husband may confirm firm or her husband may make void. Now, if her husband makes no response whatever to her from day to day, then he confirms all of her vows, can't come back later, and all the agreements that bind her, he confirms them because he made no response to her on the day that he heard them. Again, silence is viewed as consent, but if he does make them void after he has heard them, then he shall, uh, but if he does make them void, after he has heard them, then he shall bear her guilt. These are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses between a man and his wife, between a father and his daughter, in her youth, in her father's uh, house. And so this, you know, you look and say, wow, he's putting together so many gigantic things before they enter into the promised land. And here he is talking to them about keeping their word. But if, they, if he didn't have them keeping their word... Uh, and there being honesty and integrity and truthfulness and, and uh, uh, commitment behind our words, you're going to have anarchy in the nation. There's going to be a terrible reflection upon God. They'd be, they'd be like all the other nations. And then it would spoil their witness before the world. So, you know, sometimes, don't you look and you see uh, nationally and internationally all the problems that the politicians and different people are dealing with and how big the problems are and everything. And we say, boy, is it, uh, what difference does it make my little life in the world, you know, for God and all in the light of how big these problems are? God knows that there are big problems that have to be dealt with on a national and international level, but he also knows the damage that is done to his reputation, the reputation of his people by us just not keeping our vows on a daily basis. I can't change the whole world. I'm just a little guy in Modesto, California. So God says, I'll tell you what you can do, Kyle. You can keep your word that you give to people and then trust me to use that to bring glory to myself. So he gives us all our place where we can make a difference. Chapter 31. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, take vengeance on the Midianites. Here's the reason for the children of Israel. And afterward, you shall be gathered to your people. Now, this refers us back to uh, Numbers chapter 25. Remember when Balaam gave the counsel to Balak on how uh, to uh, bring judgment upon the children of Israel. He said, in essence, to Balak, you can never defeat these people from without but you can get them to bring defeat upon themselves. Their God is a jealous God, and if you take your Moabitess women and they go in among the men and they get them, you know, kind of heated up a little bit, pull out their idols and then make, you know, worshiping these idols of, of Baal and others a requirement for continuing, you know, the evening and all, then God will look at it. It will be an affront to him and he will judge them himself. And, and the, the counsel that Balaam gave to Balak uh, worked perfectly. The Balak sent in the Moabitess uh, women. They went in among the uh, children of Israel and uh, the men began to engage in idolatry and sexual immorality with the Moabitess women. And by the time God's judgment had made its way through the camp, 24,000 uh, Jewish men were dead. I mean, they, they were they were the Moabitess women and, and Balak and 
and, uh, and all of these folks, the uh, Midianites who were part of, of the tribe, uh, the group of Moab, they were all mixed together under Balak at this point in time. They accomplished uh, 24,000 times more effective than any of the curses that Balak tried to bring upon the nation of Israel from, from without. So they had tried to destroy the nation of Israel. Destroy uh, these people, destroy God's calling and purposes for them as a nation. And uh, God took note of it, and now he's going to take vengeance against them uh, for it. I think that it is very important to recognize here that it is not the children of Israel who are taking vengeance upon the Midianites. Uh, They're not doing it. God is taking vengeance upon the Midianites, and he's using the children of Israel as his human instruments. The Bible teaches in the New Testament, book of Romans, that we as Christians are not to take vengeance uh, upon uh, other people. The Bible prohibits us from doing that. The Bible prohibits us from doing that for the simple reason that we lack the knowledge that's required to exercise proper vengeance. And we also lack the necessary godly character to do it righteously. Now, God does not share our severe limitations. He he possesses the knowledge that's required and he possesses the godly character that's required to exercise vengeance upon a people and, and have it be measured and have it be exactly what justice looks like in the situation. So I think we have to be careful sometimes when we read in Numbers chapter 12 uh, again, Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, God says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And the tendency that we can have there is to look and say, All vengeance is bad. Like, oh, vengeance? Oh, no, that's a terrible... Oh, vengeance is always wrong. It isn't always wrong. It's wrong for me to take vengeance. Because I don't know what I'm doing. And when somebody does something wrong to me, it's like, all right, you hit me once, I'll hit you five times, and I'll bash your head in with a shovel. Sorry about that, but that's what you're working with here. <laughs> so, it's good God prohibits me from taking vengeance. But God can do it in a, in a dispassionate, just way. So never look at vengeance and say, vengeance is a terrible, ungodly thing. It isn't. It's, it's not a good thing in my hands or in your hands, even if you're a much meeker person. But it's okay in God's hands. It's even a righteous thing in God's hands because vengeance in the hands of God is justice. That's how it always works. He's always just in, in exercising it. So vengeance isn't condemned in a wholesale fashion, not even uh, in the New Testament. Now, uh, some people have a problem with God exercising vengeance or exercising righteous judgment. And I don't know what to say about that, um, because, see, I don't know what to say about that, (laughs) except you better get used to it, because he is going to pour his vengeance out on this world. He's going to do it for seven years, and it's called the Great Tribulation. For a lot of things, for the wickedness of this world. And, uh, and he's going to do it for the biggest sin of all, and that's the rejection of his son. For nothing, for stupidness, for sex, drugs, rock and roll, for money, for nothing. And, uh, but that judgment is going to come, and it will be a righteous judgment. You know, you read the, sa- you read the same newspaper as I do, you watch the same newscast that I do. And you look at it and you watch us morally unraveling. I'm glad I wasn't in San Francisco today to watch what went on the streets of San Francisco today in the homosexual movement. And, and, but you see the different things and you say, God, how come and why? And, and uh, I know that sometimes some people think, well, in, in light of the fact that the marriage thing has been put through and God, California deserves God's judgment, judgment is coming. That was a handful of judges. We'll see what California is made of in terms of making a righteous stand for God in November when that comes around. Then if there's nothing, then, you know, uh, buy gold, I guess. I don't know what. (laughs) Better yet, invest in the kingdom of God and the advancement of the kingdom of God around the world. 
And, uh, and so you, you've got this situation where we see everything moving so quickly against God. And we look and say, you know, God, what's going on? What are you doing? What's happening? You know, we need a revival. We need all these. But I, I think that by the time everything's said and done, by the time God pours his judgment out upon this world, he will give, have given the world enough rope to either rescue themselves and be pulled in by God to the boat or enough rope to hang themselves. There'll be no question of God's justice or his righteousness in his judgment. The problem is, is that barring a revival that we may be in the middle of of a generation that watches that progressively happen in our lifetimes. But he will be righteous when he when he ultimately uh, uh, judges and and uh, meets out vengeance. He, so when God uh, exercises vengeance, it's not because he had a bad day or he's lost his temper or something like that. He judges because he's righteous. And if he was if he did not judge, he would not be righteous. And uh, so this kind of gives us an understanding of of what's happening here. So Moses, he he spoke to the people saying, arm some of yourselves for war and let them go out against the Midianites to take vengeance. There's the word again. And then for what? For the Lord. So they're not doing it themselves. They're instruments of God. And and for for the Lord on Midianite for their attempt to destroy the, the nation of Israel and with the nation of Israel, God's people in that old covenant, God's plan uh, for for the uh, of salvation for the world. So I mean, what's at stake there when the Midianites tried to take him out, the Moabites t- tried to take him out? I mean, that reaches all the way down into this room. That they had been successful in, in what they wanted to do, what Balaam and Balak wanted to do, there'd be no salvation for us to believe in or to have. Nation would have been wiped out uh, earlier than, than uh, even Jesus being able to come into the world. And here's what they were to do. They were to take a thousand from each uh, tribe of all the tribes of Israel you shall send into war. So... They were to take a thousand from each of the twelve tribes. Twelve thousand were going to go into battle. And uh, the reason he takes a thousand from each of the twelve tribes is so that all twelve of the tribes would um, have a place in the battle that they would sense that uh, that that they that that they were participants in this righteous action uh, of God. No one was going to be left out. And so there were recruited from the divisions of Israel, 1,000 from each tribe, 12,000 armed for war. And then Moses sent them uh, to war, 1,000 from each tribe. And he sent them to war with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, who was the high priest at the time, with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. Now, this is interesting. So he's sending, he's going to uh, conduct a war against the Midianites here, but he doesn't use Joshua. Joshua is the leader of the nation of Israel at this point in time. At least there's a transition of power that's going on from Moses to him. But God doesn't say, I want Joshua to go in and lead this battle against him, against the Midianites. He calls uh, Phinehas to do that. And the reason that he does that, Phinehas being a son of the high priest, is that this battle is not a uh, a secular battle. This is a this is a religious battle. This is a spiritual battle. These people attacked the children of Israel on a spiritual level. They attacked them with idolatry and sexual immorality, trying to ruin their uh, God's plan attached to their life. And so God says that was a spiritual attack against my people. I will have a spiritual leader lead them into the battle. It's interesting that you would think, well, God would choose Eliezer, the father, who is the high priest to lead into battle. Why did he send his son Phineas? And I think it's because Phineas rose up, as you remember, back in chapter 25. 
and he brought an end to the plague among the children of Israel by taking the spear and running it through uh, the Hebrew man and the uh, Moabitess woman who were involved in the idolatry and the fornication in their tent. And so he had already shown the zeal for the battle, and God says, we'll just continue this through him. He was to go into battle with the holy articles and the signal trumpets uh, in his hands, and uh, these represented, would have represented the presence of God with the people as they headed out uh, into the battle. And they warred against the Midianites, just as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all of the males. Now, they probably, it doesn't mean that they killed every Midianite in the whole wide world. Uh, it probably refers just to the Midianites who were living in that area that had been a part of this kind of attack, a subtle attack upon the children of Israel, because in less than 100 years, 100 years or so, the Midianites are going to uh, be involved in a military uh, action with the children of Israel. So if they were completely wiped out, they wouldn't be able to do that. So it was just probably those just in that geographical uh, area, and then those that were outside of that geographical area uh, came into play about a uh, hundred years later. And they killed the kings of uh, Midian with the rest of those uh, who were killed. Uh, Evi uh, Rechem Zur, who was the father uh, of, of the woman that got uh, uh, speared through with, with the, with the uh, Jewish man there by Phineas. Her and Reba, the five kings of uh, Midian. Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with a sword. So he... He, he betrayed the children of Israel. He used his gift from God to betray him and, and to bring destruction among them. Balak had promised him great wealth. He no doubt received great wealth. And now he's a part of, in the company, not of the children of Israel, but he's in the company of, of these people. And now he, he dies and he's killed in the battle. So he, he got all that money for doing the wrong thing. And he didn't even have time to spend it. <laughs> Apart from the Lord, you can't enjoy two quarters. You can't enjoy anything in life. So he got all this stuff, but he had, he had to betray God and betray the people to do that. You're not going to enjoy that. And you remember as he prayed over the nations of, of Israel, there they are, they're camped out in the shape of a cross, out in the plain and everything. And he said, let me die the death of the righteous, speaking of them, and let my end be like his. The problem is, is he wasn't willing, he couldn't die the death of a righteous because he wasn't willing to live the life of the righteous. I think Jeff Lusane, when he taught here a couple of weeks ago, one of the things, he said a lot of very, very good things. And uh, one of the th observations that he made is that uh, people, we die the way we lived, but the way we live. And that's that's the fact of the matter. And when we're on our deathbed or whatever's happening there, that's not a time to be looking for a relationship with God or trying to make up for 20 years or something like that. We face death at that time on the basis of a current relationship that we have have with with God. And uh, and so, you know, the the importance of of walking close with God, walking righteously uh, with him and uh, and then we'll have the death uh, of the righteous. So uh, this is what is happening here. He's killed along with the others. And the children of Israel, verse nine, took the women of Midian captive with their little ones. And they took as spoil all their cattle, all their flocks and all their goods. They also burned with fire all the cities where they dwelt and all their forts. And they took all the spoil and all the booty of man and beast and then they brought uh, the captives, the booty, and the spoil to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the congregation of the children of Israel, to the camp in the plains of Moab, by the Jordan, across from Jericho. And Moses, Eleazar the priest, and all the leaders of the congregation went to meet them outside the camp. And so... They didn't allow them to bring this whole group into the camp, uh, lest they defile the camp because of the battle and all. So they went out to meet them. Now, it's interesting, the destruction of, uh, at least on this level, of the Midianites accomplished a 
a spiritual and a righteous vengeance for what they had done in attempting to wipe out the Jews. But on a practical level, what it what it removed was it removed the Midianites as a danger militarily to them being left on their rear when they would go in and conquer uh, the promised land. And so here they come with all of the captives and they come with uh, all of all of the spoils and they present it now to the leaders of Israel. But Moses, we're told, was angry with the officers of the army, with the captains over thousands and the captains over hundreds who had come from the battle. And Moses said to them, have uh, have you kept all the women alive? Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. And now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known a man intimately. So Moses is angry. The cause of his anger was that they left the women alive who had deliberately used themselves in an attempt to uh, destroy uh, the nation of Israel, to get them to bring destruction upon themselves. And although they had been uh, unsuccessful in the grand scheme of things, they'd been successful again in the death of 24,000 men. So these are not innocent victims of, of, of war. These are women who just deliberately and actively uh, were in, engaged in a plan to destroy the nation of, of Israel. Now, if you look at that and you say, this is, this is kind of a, a, you know, a wild excess of judgment against what has happened. It isn't true. Notice in verse 18. And then uh, Moses declares, but... That's a, that's a key word. I mean, he's he he's he's taken very, very uh, strong measures here. But he declares, keep alive for yourselves all the young girls who have not known a man intimately. Do spare those that had no part in this plot against the children of Israel. In other words, what it tells us there in verse 18 is that God's judgment, as strong as it is, and it's very strong, it is not an out of control Judgment. It is measured. It is very, very deliberate. It has boundaries that are not to be exceeded. And so he doesn't get he doesn't exercise vengeance in a way that we might. His judgment is always measured and very careful. And as for you, he said to this, these victorious warriors coming back, remain outside the camp for seven days. Whoever has killed any person and whoever has touched any slain, purify yourself and your captives on the third day and on the the seventh day. Purify every garment, everything made of leather, everything woven of goat's hair and everything made of Wood. And, and so they were to cleanse themselves. They, they had been ceremonially rendered ceremonially unclean because of their touching of dead bodies. And so he says, you need to have a, a period of cleansing. And then Eliezer, the priest, said to the men of war, who has, uh, who has gone to the battle? This is the ordinance of the Lord, which the Lord commanded Moses. Only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead, everything that can endure fire you shall put through the fire and it shall be clean and it shall be purified with a water of purification but all that cannot endure fire you shall put through water and you shall wash your clothes on the seventh day and be clean and afterward you may come into the camp and so they're bringing in all of this a spoil from the battle and God says the spoil from the battle needs to be ceremonially cleansed. So anything that of metal was to be put through a fire to represent the cleansing. Anything that wouldn't survive a fire was to be washed by water. They were to wash themselves, wash their clothes and remain outside the camp for seven days. Now, there's something really um, Uh, beautiful uh, uh, about this requirement uh, by God that they would ceremonially cleanse themselves before they'd be allowed back into the camp. They've been used by God to exercise judgment against the Midianites and against the the Moabites uh, here. But what God is saying when they come back and says, listen, you've done that and all that, but I want you to to take the time now to be ceremonially cleansed. The idea is don't enjoy it. 
Don't enjoy what just happened. I don't think God enjoyed what just happened. But he had to do what just happened. So we've done it. You had to go out to do it. You did it. And now you've been rendered unclean. It's not a time for celebration or anything like that. Lives were taken. Blood was shed over that. And so let, let's, let's have a, a time of so, sober reflection related to it. And then you can come back into the camp. So the Lord never casually uh, sheds blood. And he didn't want that, uh, that kind of an attitude to be in the minds of his, his people. I mean, surely he weeps when he has to. Uh, he's not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want to judge uh, people. And he's forced into it. And so it was to be a time of, of that kind of sober thinking about death, even when the death is, is righteous. I think we think about, you know, capital punishment even today. And people have arguments about capital punishment in the Bible. What does it say? The Bible is very clear. Capital punishment is a biblical thing. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, a country has to do it. But there's the freedom for a government to exercise the sword and not to carry the sword in vain and, and, and all. Uh, so, but even where, you know, the most heinous kind of criminal is is killed or executed because of their crime. It's for the child of God it's not a time to go out and light off fireworks or anything like that. Even no matter what kind of a monster they were, uh, it's a time just to reflect and, and uh, you know just see the thing how uh, in the same broken hearted way that God would. It must be done. But uh, it, there are things that we shouldn't r- rejoice in in a way that doesn't look like the Lord. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Count up the plunder that was taken of man and beast, you and Eleazar the priest, and the chief fathers of the congregation, and divide the plunder into two parts. Number one, between those who took part in the war, the 12,000, who went out to battle, and then number two, all the rest of the congregation. And levy a tribute for the Lord on the men of war who went out to battle. Here's the tribute. They're to give one of every 500 of the persons, the cattle, the donkeys, and the sheep. Take it from their half. Give it to Eliezer the priest as a heave offering to the Lord. So half of it, they come back. God says, I want half of it to go to the people who didn't go out to battle, but they supplied the camp that allowed this group to go out to battle. Nobody can go out to battle without uh, a camp and supply lines and support and all those things. I forget, some of you might know off the top of your head, half of what I learn I forget within five minutes. No, 90% of what I learn I forget. But you, you take in a military campaign, I don't know what it is now, I know kind of what the statistics were in World War II, but the number of support people that were required for every man that was on the front line, it's staggering the proportion. So God said, I want the camp to be rewarded for this. So they get half of it. Uh, Now you're talking about two to three million people. They're going to divide that half. The 12,000 that went to battle, they get the other half. So they get a, you know, a a much larger portion because of of putting their life on the line for what God had had called them to do there. So this is the division of uh, of of the spoils. So it was to be divided up. If you remember, uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, later on, King David, when he has a great victory and he goes out with a small number of men and, and he has a, a great victory against the enemies of Israel. And it, as he has that victory, there are a group of men. They were too tired. I mean, everybody has physical limitations. Not everybody is a Navy SEAL. Not everyone is a Marine. They can only go so far. That group got left behind and when David came back the people that went and fought with him David was a Navy SEAL kind of guy Green Beret they came back and these guys said we're not sharing this you know spoil with these people that couldn't David said nope we're going to divide it equally among everyone and he made it a law in the nation of Israel and I'm inclined to believe that David thought back to this particular passage and incident as kind of a biblical basis for for his action and then he said in verse 30 From the children of Israel's half, you shall take one of every 50 drawn from the persons, the cattle, the donkeys, the sheep, from all the livestock and give them to the Levites who keep charge uh, of the tabernacle of the Lord. And so Moses 
uh, and Eleazar the priest did as the Lord commanded. So they were each to give a certain portion, proportion of their spoil to the Lord. The children, uh, the, the 12,000 that went out to battle there in verse 28, they were to give one of every 500. And uh, I'm not that great at math, but I, I think that equals out to two tenths of one percent. And, and then in verse 30, the children of Israel, they were to give one of every 50. So they would give two percent. So those who went out to battle gave a far smaller portion proportionally as a tribute to the Lord. Obviously, they put their life uh, on the line for the battle. And the booty remained from the plunder, uh, which the men of war had taken, was 675,000 sheep. Wow! That's a lot of sheep. <laughs> and not only that many sheep, 72,000 cattle, 61,000 donkeys, 32,000 persons in all of women who had not known a man intimately. You're talking about over 800,000 animals total, not even counting the people. So what it speaks of is how great a victory this was, how in supernatural of victory this was that God had given to them. And the half, the portion uh, for those who had gone out to war uh, was in number 337,500 sheep. So this is the half that, the, the, that went to them. And then the Lord's tribute of that particular amount of sheep was 675. The cattle, they, they got a, a total amount of 36,000, uh, of which the Lord's tribute was 72. Of the donkeys, 30,500, of which the Lord's tribute was 61. Now, if you ever wonder if God knows how much you give to him for work of the kingdom and obedience and tithes and offerings, he, he, he watches it. He's aware of what's going on. Now, I'm not going to take an offering, but it's good to talk about once in a while. The persons were 16,000, of which the Lord's tribute was 32 persons. And so Moses gave the tribute, which was the Lord's heave offering, to Eleazar the priest, as the Lord commanded Moses. So that was their portion of the tribute, one of every 500. And from the children of Israel, uh, their half, which Moses separated from the men who fought, now the half belonging to the congregation, was 337,500 sheep, 36,000 cattle, 35,500 donkeys, and 16,000 persons. And from the children of Israel, Moses, uh, Israel's half, Moses took one of every 50 drawn from man and beast and gave them to the Levites who kept charge of the tabernacle of the Lord as the Lord had commanded. So they obeyed the Lord. And then the officers who were over the thousands uh, of the army, the captain of thousands and the captain of hundreds, the leader of this military force, they came near uh, to Moses. And they said to Moses, your servants have taken account of the men of war who are under um, who are under our command and not a man of us is missing. They wiped out all the Midianites and they didn't lose a single man. So they recognize this is absolutely supernatural. God was with us on, on this whole, whole thing. So they, they look at it and, and they, they recognize uh, God's protection. And they're not just going to go, wow, that's cool. God protected us. And now where's my loot? You know, or where's my spoil? Uh, they're going to take the time now to acknowledge God. God, that was totally you. Nobody could be in the middle of that battle and not lose a single person except that your favor was upon us. How much of God's grace do you suppose you recognize in your life? Don't shout out. It's not a guilt thing. I'll answer for me. For you. I, I don't think I recognize 5% of the grace that God pours out on my life on a daily basis. I doubt that it's less than 1%. I think he does so much for us every day, all day, that's unseen and unnoticed by us. It's just a staggering amount of grace. But then there comes those times where there is something that is so big, so obvious, that there's no missing it. And then when we see those things, it's good for us to stop like these men do. And say, God, I know 
I miss about 99% of what you're doing around my life. But I see this 1%, and I'm going to stop, and I'm going to give you praise, and I'm going to give you acknowledgement in what you have just done here for me. And that's what they do. None of us can know everything and give him praise for everything that he does. But the things that we notice, he's, he's do the worship and the thanksgiving. They do a good thing here. And therefore we have brought an offering for the Lord. What every man found of ornaments of gold, armlets and bracelets and signet rings and earrings and necklaces to make atonement for ourselves before the Lord. So they, they, they had been in the battle and, and uh, of course, people carried their wealth and, and, and uh, uh, you know, a cheap way of transporting it was for it to be in the form of gold, in the form of jewelry. So they ended up with a tremendous amount of gold jewelry. And so they brought this now as an offering to the Lord for in recognition of his grace. And so Moses and Eliezer, the priests, received the gold from them, all of the fashioned ornaments. And all the gold of the offering that they offered to the Lord from the captains of thousands and the captains of hundreds was 16,750 shekels, which is over 400 pounds of gold. What's gold going for an ounce today? I don't know what it is. 800 to 1,000. How much? 900? Okay, there we go. How many ounces in a pack? We could work this thing out right now. <laughs> Who's got their calculator? So we're talking about a huge a value in, in terms of gold that they offer to the Lord. It was theirs to keep. It was a free will offering. God didn't say, listen, I'm going to, boy, if they spend any of that, I'm going to guilt them so bad they won't be able to live with themselves. It's none of that. It's, they can do whatever they want with it. They say, God, you're too much. We've got to express our worship toward you uh, in this way. Over 400 pounds of gold. And the men of, war had, uh, the men of war had taken spoil every man for himself. By the way, thank you for that answer. And Moses and Eliezer the priest received the gold from the captains of thousands and of hundreds and brought it into the tabernacle of meeting as a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord. I am... So want to get into chapter 32. But I love you too much to keep you here till nine o'clock. So we'll just let that go. 32 is amazing. It's all just one right after another. The lessons that are found in there. But we'll hold there so we can have some time to worship the Lord this evening as a, as a closing part of our our service too. So lots of things, good things to look at in terms of our, our vows and in terms of judgment. And I just think, I think about my sin and I, I don't think about it much. And I certainly don't think about it in any kind of detail because the Lord doesn't want me to do that. But I think about the judgment that my sin deserves. And some people come to know the Lord and I'm not putting them down. But they come to know the Lord and they struggle with the whole concept that they're a sinner and in need of a savior. Then there's the rest of us who come in and God tells us that we're sinners and it's like no need, don't even spend three minutes developing that point. That I already understand is their hope for me. <laughs> so the rest of us, we recognize the judgment that we deserve from a holy God. I'm going to be in heaven someday. I'm a sinner like everybody else. I don't want anybody to know the details of my life the way that God does. I'm a sinner. And the blood of Jesus Christ has made me acceptable that not only will I one day be in heaven, but I will fit into heaven because of the righteousness of Christ that's been applied to me. It's a wonderful thing to have passed out from under the righteous judgment that my sin deserves in order to be forgiven that I never will ever face God as my judge but I will only face him as my savior if you sit here tonight and you've never made Jesus your savior and your Lord never trusted him for the forgiveness of your sins you wonder is there hope for me is there forgiveness for me there is hope for you and forgiveness for you God loves to save sinners 
Paul said concerning the Lord, he, he spoke of himself as the chiefest of sinners. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. He said that God saves sinners of whom I am chief. Now, I would argue with him over that because I happen to think Don Loudermilk's the chiefest of sinners. <laughs> you think about the guilt Paul had. Fought the body of Christ. Hold the jackets while Stephen is stoned to death. Incarcerating, yanking people out of their homes just because of their faith in Christ and, 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 and consenting toward their death and all these things. The things the devil could have pounded him with. No forgiveness for you, but he was strong in the forgiveness of God. You sit here today, there's hope for you. God will forgive. He will love to forgive you. And then he will make you a trophy of his grace. You know what that looks like? People will look at you and say, God will save anybody. God will forgive anybody. That's humbling. But that's what Paul looked at himself as. He said, that's the kind of trophy I am. I give hope to the whole world that God will save and forgive anyone. And so it is with us. So much to be thankful to the Lord for tonight. Let's worship him a little bit more before we close. Worship team, come forward and lead us.